I chose Nandu School because it's one of the best schools in social work and it also has nine research centers that are dedicated to social work fields. I wanted to come here just so I can learn more about trauma and be the best um, therapist that I can be. I chose the Mandel School because I felt like it would give me all of the skills and tools I needed as well as the connections in my home region to be able to make a difference where I care about the most. All the opportunities that I really wanted with my um, internship and research opportunities and I'm truly so glad that I chose the Mandel School. I didn't think that they would accept someone like me, an inner city girl who didn't have the greatest grades, but they welcomed me with open, open, open arms. They have a lot of offerings in the field of trauma studies, and I really wanted to be able to um, study and do work in the field of trauma with kids and families and adults. I asked myself which school I would regret most if I don't go, and here uh, came into my mind. I remember applying during the pandemic and asking myself what change that I want to see in my community. And I knew that I would find that complex solution right here at the Mendel School. Good afternoon. Come on, let's have a little bit more of a call and response. Good afternoon. So I am delighted to welcome you to our 2024 Impact Talk. So these Impact Talks started three years ago. Our first round of Impact Talks, we had about 300 registrants across all four talks. Last year, we had almost 900 folks who registered for the four Impact Talks. And today we have over 100 folks joining us online for today's Impact Talks. Come on, you can give them a round of applause. Some of these folks online are our community partners where they're receiving free continuing education units. Uh, we have some prospective students, some admitted students. Hey, online, welcome. So I have uh, an easy task today to just tell you a little bit about the Mandel School. So we are so proud that we are the number nine school in the nation, but also the number one school in the state of Ohio. But more importantly, we are proud of the innovation, transformation, and our focus on equity. Let me just give you a few interesting factoids. This past fall, we received applications from 890 students from 33 countries to join our MSW program. Last year, we had 136 applications from 12 countries, right? So the Mandel School is hot, y'all, okay? A lot of folks want to come to the Mandel School. Last year, and for the day of giving, we were the number one academic unit across all schools at Case Western University for the Day of Giving. Yeah, I heard someone said, wow, right? And all those resources go towards supporting our gifted and talented change leaders. One of our gifted and talented change leaders is here today. Uh, you'll hear from Nikki. I heard her the first time last summer and I was blown away. She's homegrown, a graduate of our program, and a powerhouse. And Nikki's family is right here. Family, could you just kind of wave? <laughs> so I'd like to welcome you again to the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel School of Applied Social Sciences. Welcome you to the first in our series of impact talks. And please give a round of applause to Dean Kim McFarlane, who is going to introduce our speaker for today. Thank you, Dean Vosan. It is so rewarding and exciting to be here to introduce a good friend and colleague, Nikki Betts. Uh, my name is Kim McFarlane, as was mentioned, and I serve as the Assistant Dean of Student Services and Career Planning here at the Mandel School. And as I said, today I have the honor of introducing Marquitis Nikki Betts. And she is a proud MSSA fellow alum of the school who works as an adjunct professor here and also in the field as a licensed social worker at Cuyahoga County Division of Children and Family Services. 
I could probably go on for a long time with all of the th roles she has served in, but as a change leader, panelist and board member, a uh, former commencement speaker, and may I also add a wonderful mentor and teacher to our students at the Mandel School. Yes. <laughs> Nikki's hard work and dedication have truly made a difference in our community and in the school. She has worked in child welfare for 10 years and has had quite a journey in her professional career. During that time, she's run into many obstacles, rewards, hardships, and opportunities. Her time here in the intensive weekend program has truly helped shape the trajectory and impact of her work. Today, Nikki will take us on a bit of that journey and share some of her experiences and knowledge throughout her presentation. We are so grateful to have Nikki as our first speaker of our Impact Talk series for 2024. And without further ado, would you join me in welcoming her to the podium? Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, oh, and to online, hello. <laughs> It is my honor to be here with you this afternoon. Um, my special thanks to the faculty and my friends and colleagues at Children and Family Services, as well as my family and the Case Western Reserve University. Uh, I'm so glad to be here. Um, so today, yeah, they got it right. I'm gonna take you on a little bit of journey about my um, experience in child welfare and here at Children and Family Services, as well as Case Western Randall. So um, when I signed up to serve, um, I knew I enlisted to serve my community. I knew I was going to serve vulnerable populations, and I knew that there were others serving with me. So according to the National Association of Social Workers, there's over 700,000 of us who have signed up, dedicated to work in this field and do the work. Yeah. Service is our call to order. Now, many of us are at the nonprofit organizations. They're in doing clinical work, that direct practice, and we need them there, and those hospitals and definitely those schools. But me, I chose the easy route. <laughs> I went into child welfare, right? Who doesn't love kids, right? Who doesn't love to see individuals and families grow? And so that's where I landed. It was pretty funny to begin with because I didn't even see myself as working in child welfare. A little known secret, I was gonna be a nurse but the chemistry got to me. <laughs> but I married a nurse, and that was, I got points for that one. <laughs> I'm working in child welfare and things are great. I love it. I'm seeing positive impacts. I'm really skilled at what I do. I'm getting awards and recognitions. I even get promoted quickly to a specialized unit where now I'm investigating allegations of abuse and neglect for vulnerable populations that have suffered severe severe maltreatment. But I like it, it's challenging my skills. I'm doing well in that, so well, that one day I'm at work and I'm like, oh, I just don't feel well. I've been having difficulties for about a week now. And my husband's like, yeah, something's off. You need to go to the doctor. And I'm like, yeah, I might, I think I have the flu. So I go to the doctor and she says, hey, wait a minute. You, you don't have flu, have you? And I said, no, let's see. But my husband had dropped me off, and he was like, I'll be back. I'll make sure that the kids are okay, and then I'll pick you up. We'll get some medicine and you'll be fine. But she came back into the room and she said, congratulations. And I said, I'm confused. <laughs> Who gets congratulations at a medical office for a disease or a sickness? She said, no. Oh, I get it. I need to call my husband. <laughs> He's going to be very surprised. And I did. And I said, hey, I got something to tell you. <laughs> he said, oh, I'll be right there. I'm on my way. Oh, no, you might want to take your time. <laughs> oh, needless to say, nine months later, Marissa is here. <laughs> and we named her Marissa. So we have our youngest daughter with us. And we got two older ones, and I think the third time is going to be the charm. We got this parenting thing down. So I love it. I'm a mom, a new baby, right? Life is good. Oh, I have so much time off. 
that I took four months off from work. Oh, best four months of my life. That kiddo got me some renewed strength. We're exercising. <laughs> we're taking naps. <laughs> and we're going shopping. Best time in my life. But the clock was ticking, and I had to go back. Right? Oh, and it's OK. I've been here before. I've been working in the field of social work for 10 years. But this time, it was a little different. When I went back, um, I had awareness that when you're working in the field of child welfare, you're at high risk for burnout, compassion fatigue, and that vicarious trauma. I had that knowledge, but it was for others and not me. I had never experienced it, so I thought. But I'll tell you that I got a call. Uh, it was my first emergency after being off for four months. And there's a four-month-old child at the emergency room. He has suffered severe, severe physical injuries. It's a sibling group, and he has two other siblings that are currently in the care of their grandmother. And you can see them in a moment. But I need to get to the hospital. Hi, Nikki. I'm greeted by my colleagues. Hi, ladies. They helped me give birth to Marissa. But I'm here working today. Oh, is there a child in the PICU that you called for? I said, oh, we understand. This way. And when I went into the PICU, for the first time in my professional career, I froze. I immediately froze. I saw a child laying in a NICU. He had a C collar on. I didn't even know they made him that little. He was only four months of age. He had a mask over his eye. He had toes and fingers that were black and blue and purple. And I really didn't understand that, because the referral said he had a spider bite. Are you sure he wasn't involved in an accident? And they said, no. These injuries were intentional. Oh, I get it. So unfortunately, I began to cry, right there in the middle of the hospital. I even shocked myself. And I was like, oh, I think it's time for me to go. So I went to the hospital to see him, and I made sure that the girls were OK. But the alleged offender was his father, and I had to go see him face to face. He was incarcerated, and they made arrangements for me to see him and interview him at the jail. And I couldn't understand it, because for me, I saw the face of my daughter, who I had just left at home. So I couldn't understand how someone would do that intentionally to a child. And yes, I got all the other questions answered, but my main one was why. He looked me dead in my face, and he said, he's not mine. And he walked away. Ah, oh, that changed something within me. I immediately felt this feeling that I had never felt before. It was not about compassion anymore. It was about accountability. I went back to work, and I was determined to make sure he was held accountable for his actions, including the child's mother. I saw no empathy for them. I didn't understand it. I was mean, and I was ugly. I was. So much to the point where I'm working in a colleague, Ms. Valerie Epps. We do team decision-making meetings together. And she said, hey, Nikki. You're not yourself. You usually come in, you're pretty articulate, but you're really mean and unprofessional to the clients now. And I said, oh, Ms. Valerie, you got it all wrong. We've been here doing this work for so long, but the rose-colored glasses are off for me now. I've seen an evil that will always be amongst us, and I don't like it. And I'm thinking about moving and leaving this job. I want to leave the field of social work completely. You guys can have it. I'm going to Walmart. And at the time, Walmart had the coolest vest. They had the yellow button. Everyone smiled, and I saw myself giving people cards. And she said, well, tell me more. And I said, let's be serious with each other. 
I've worked with you long enough. The work that we're doing isn't changing anyone. It's continuously to get worse. I'll tell you, I was even at my desk a couple weeks ago, and I logged onto the computer, and I couldn't see the screen. I'm not sleeping well. The interviews are replaying in my head. And so she took me by my hand, and she said, Nikki, the things that you are describing are vicarious trauma. And I was like, no. <laughs> she said, yes. I need you to take care of you. And I said, no. The work is here. I have a court hearing for him next week. I'll make sure I'm in front of that judge to tell him exactly what he's done. I have the results of that DNA test. And to his surprise, he is the father. She said, OK, that's fine. But I need you to hear me differently. Marissa needs her mother. And I was like, she has her mother. She's fine. She said, no. Your service begins with you. And I said, OK. And I went home. And her words were replaying in my head. So I talked to my husband. And I said, hey, I think it's time for me to quit. I'm going to quit. And he said, no. <laughs> and I was like, yes. He was like, no. And I'll tell you why. No one cares more about those children than you do. You're hurting now, and we've always made a pact. You'll never make a decision when your emotions are too high. If things have calmed down, and when they do, if you have the same feelings and you want to leave, I'll support you. But give it some time. OK because I filled out a couple of applications already. He just didn't know, right? So I go back to work. And I have a renewed sense. I'm still competitive. I'm still fighting for families. But as soon as this case with this father and this family is resolved, I'm leaving. But I'm at work one day, and an email comes across my desk. Ah. It's the email from Case Western Reserve University. Professor Strom is going to be at Children and Family Services. He's going to talk to us about the intensive weekend program. I don't care. Too little, too late. Children's Services doesn't give you a bonus for getting your master's degree or promote you to supervision or anything. I don't need those skills. I got the award for Supervisor of the Social Worker of the Year. They've already told me I'm doing a good job. My husband was like, uh, why don't you just go to the open house and see what they're talking about? OK. Oh, and guess what? There's also an email talking about a child welfare fellowship. They'll cover the cost of the tuition if you go back to school. But there's a commitment that you have to continue to work in child welfare. Oh, no thanks. <laughs> I knew there was a catch. Again, he says, just see what it's about and apply. I did. I apply, and I get accepted. That's cool. That's a form letter. They didn't want me. I grew up in a community not too far from here. The community of Huff, and we called it Huff Heights, because it was only in our dreams <laughs> that it was a thriving community. Oh, but there are professionals from that community, the Stokes brothers and others, and Fannie Mae's, that don't get as much notoriety, but have served their, com their communities, and they look like me. So I apply, and I also apply for that Child Welfare Fellowship. Oh, but this time the email says, congratulations, you are awarded the fellowship. So now I got a decision to make. I go. And one of the first things they do is have an open house, and it's a test. And I said, on day one, oh, you got to go to the library, the Harris Library. And you got to pass the test. You got to show them and demonstrate that you know how to navigate it. And I go to the Kelvin Library. Oh my gosh, the shelves move. <laughs> I am in the wrong place. <laughs> Where is that librarian? All right, she has the wrinkles. 
and she helps walk you through that. So I talked to Professor Strong, and I said, excuse me, um, can I talk to you and Dr. Victor Groza? I think I made a mistake, and I don't want to waste your time or anyone else's. This isn't for me. I cannot do this. This is challenging, and you named it intensive for a reason. <laughs> it is intensive. Oh, and Dr. Strong said, yes, it's intensive. That was intentional. Oh, but did you know that there are faculty and staff here that will help you? We will be along with the ride for you. We'll walk beside you step by step. We won't do the work for you, but we'll help you process it, make different connections for you. And I said, are you sure? And he was like, yeah, trust me. I thought about it, and I go back to work. And this time, there's a knock on the door. Oh, I've seen her before. I know she's a supervisor in our sex abuse department, but I don't know her name. Oh, she says, hi, my name's Erica. You don't know me, but I know you. Uh, I've seen your work, and I also heard that you're going back to school for children and family services through the intensive weekend program. And I said, someone knows a lot about me, and I don't know a lot about her. But you're right. She says, ah, I did too. And I think that we can do this together. And I said, oh, I'm sorry, Miss Erica, but I don't think I'll be joining you at Case Western. And she said, no. <laughs> um, I think that we're going to do it together. There's another lady here. Her name's Jennifer Crosman, and you may not know her either. But the three of us will do it, and we'll do it together. I think of us as the three musketeers. All for one and one for all. And I said, okay, Miss Erica, I'm gonna hold you to that. <laughs> and we did. We went through the intensive weekend program. She was one of my peers and mentors and supervision. Oh, and she helped me stay grounded. There were others that I developed relationships with. Oh, wonderful, intelligent, compassionate people that joined us in our fight to learn new skills, new knowledge to help us win the war that we were fighting. Beautiful people. Our cohort was awesome. Oh, we were able to connect with each other outside of the community rooms here, Case, right? We were able to say, hey, I have a child that's struggling with um, identity issues or mental health, and I had new resources and new colleagues that would help me with identify a new path. Oh, this feels good. These are great individuals. Oh. And we did, we made it. We celebrated. Oh, did we celebrate? <laughs> It was something to complete that process together, to stay united, to make sure that no one was left behind. The text messages that said, do you remember this assignment is due? Don't forget to do that. Oh, awesome. So now I'm at work, and I was like, wait a minute, I gotta do something different with these skills. Because I met a Miss Breath Brenda. She was my faculty advisor. She said, hey, um, we did that scale, and your kite is perfect. It tells me that you learn best by seeing, hearing, and experiencing it. Most importantly, you need to really enhance your emotional intelligence. You're, you're important to people, and how you show up in their experience matters. So work on your self-awareness. OK, I know I talk with my hands, Ms. Breath and my eyes get all big, I'll work on that. Because people can read my face before my words even come out of my mouth. I got it, Beth. Oh, but there, there was a Zoe Bryn Wood. You may know her. Now, our relationship started off a little struggling, right? She took points off from my first paper. <laughs> but the paper was a reflection. <laughs> 
so I didn't understand how you got points off for your own thoughts. <laughs> I said, no. But Ms. Zoe said, Nikki, listen, I'm trying to get you to articulate your perspective. That's what I'm going for. No one will ask you your grade point average when you graduate here. I was like, but that matters. I got a 4.0, Zoe. This is not helping. She says, trust me. They want to know the knowledge and the skills and if you're capable of doing the job. That's fair. So I take her advice. I start investing in others. Most importantly, I get a promotion at work, and now I'm the supervisor of a unit. Ah, oh, these are new caseworkers coming in. We get cases at a slower, slower rate, so we, have, we spend time getting to know the families, and their new colleagues coming in behind me. Oh, it feels good. But this time, there's another case that comes in. The case is a young lady She's about five. She's not in school. She's isolated from her community. And my worker has gone out there. And she's new, so she doesn't have the words. But luckily, we had talked. And she said, hey, Nikki, we need a word or something. Oh, I get it. When your emotions get too high and that brain is traumatized and the words can't come out, send me an image. And she said, oh, I got it. Popsicles. I'll tell you popsicles when something doesn't make sense to me. She called me from the home and she said, Nikki, popsicles. And I said, I'm not with you. You're my eyes. You got to be able to tell me. She said, I can't. All I know is my stomach is saying that this child needs some support. She's thin and she doesn't look well. Oh, that's fair. How about we get her to the hospital? Oh, and she goes to the hospital. Our skills and resources help us to convince the caregivers to go to the hospital with that child. And she gets a nutrition plan and all type of services. And she has gained weight in that short period of time that we have her. But it's a Saturday night. And I get a call. She has suffered some significant injuries, and she has not survived them. Ah, oh, I've been here before. Ah, oh, but this time, Dr. Groza's words are in my mind. When I moved to that transition unit, I didn't tell you. It wasn't by choice. My leadership has said, hey, you're writing up all of the workers. You're firing them. That's not a good thing. And I was like, oh, but it is. If they're not committed to doing this work, then they can go work at Walmart. And my husband said, yeah, but Nikki, you're a team of one. And I was like, I can start from scratch. That's not the purpose. If you went into supervision to make a positive impact, you will need to learn the skills of a true leader. True leaders empower those that are behind them and give them the knowledge and the skills and the motivation to follow their path. No one is following you now. Oh. I call Dr. Groza because my husband is always talking. <laughs> Dr. Groza, they're moving me to another department and I think it's a setup. They want me to work with the new workers. And he says, Nikki, have you ever heard of the proverb that you are to bloom where you are planted. That is, it's not necessary the individual, but the environment. I said, that makes sense. So I pour into my worker. Ah. And she's coming to me and she says, ah, I don't think I'll be able to do this. And I said, that sounds familiar. Can I talk to you about a program that they're offering at Case Western Reserve University? <laughs> Not only does she go, but for the second time in my professional career, I cry at work because she graduates as a recipient of the Child Welfare Fellowship. And her future. 
Ah, it's endless. Oh, that was a fun one. Oh, but I'm also doing my work. I get promoted. I am now the director of the North Central Regional Training Center. Ah, oh, this feels good. Now I have the potential to impact other programs, policies, and procedures. I get to speak to different stakeholders. Oh, but wait a minute. No one told me there were challenges in leadership, too. <laughs> so I'm calling up Dr. Brinwood, ah, uh, and Adrian, and Dana, and Nancy. My Case Western family has got to help me through this one because I have a challenge in my training room and those emotions have returned and I don't feel so good about it. Oh, but they answered the back call and they said, Nikki, you're on the right side of this. Lean into us. Let us be your sounding board. And I said, okay. Oh, so I continue to grow. Oh, and I'll tell you it's challenging. But one of the most important things that I'm able to do in that position is to use my influence to create an environment that is trauma-informed. Oh, I get to convert that lactation room into a wellness center. Many of the people that I was working with and servicing and my colleagues are triggered by the information that they need to learn the skills to do the child welfare work. They have personal lived experience and they don't know how to manage their emotions even soon enough to receive the training that I'm giving them. So we create a space. Oh, and we're not just blowing bubbles. Many are confused. They're not working. They're playing with the dog. Oh, let me talk to you about mindfulness. It's important. And believe me, you, by the time we're done talking, you'll love that sand. It helps you to get grounded and get focused on what you're here for. Oh, I love that. I'm a director, and one of the programs that I'm overseeing, oh, those are caregivers that are interested in becoming licensed foster parents. And I'm at work one day, and a lady comes up to me, and I'm busy running around, and she says, Hi, Nikki. I say, hi, ma'am. Oh, your training's in classroom three. One moment till we set up. And she says, ah, oh, you don't recognize me, do you? Oh, I'm sorry. I don't. Oh, but I stop and I pay attention. It's her. She has a little bit more gray in her hair. Oh, her crown of wisdom is shining. She has a smile on her face. And she said, is it okay if I show you a picture? I said, sure. She whips out her cell phone, and there's three children. One is graduating from high school. In the middle, there's a young man, and he has on glasses, and his other sister is beside him. Ah, oh, he's 14 now. She said, how do you remember that? I said, oh, I didn't tell you. But your family was the first family I became working with when I returned back from my maternity leave, and my daughter is also 14. That's how I know. She said, she didn't, you didn't share that with me. Oh, but it wasn't about me. Servicing your family is what kept me here. Oh, how is the eye? How are the knuckles? How are the toes? Oh, they healed, Nikki. Do you remember when you referred us for therapy? We did the family therapy and we did everything that you suggested. He has limited vision in his eye, but he's well. He's bright and he's funny, and I would love for you to meet him. For the third time in my professional career, I cried at work. Oh, but wait a minute. You never asked my question. Why are you here? Oh, that's because they'll be graduating soon. And it's time for me to become a foster parent and give back to other kids the way you've shown me and that you have poured into my family. Oh, be still my heart. Let me know if you need anything. So I'll tell you, 
My experiences, they all cultivated in being resilient in the field of child welfare. Resiliency is not about pizza parties. It is not about putting that mask on. It is about being authentic with yourself. Having a support system around you that will let you be your authentic self. They will sign up with you to do those weird activities. <laughs> They'll go jump jack with you. <laughs> They'll definitely let you apply for scholarships for them. <laughs> because they don't know it yet, but those opportunities are leaving positive influence on their lives, and when they look back, and it may not be immediate, they'll appreciate it. Resiliency is about doing your work. Saying to yourself that it is okay to seek help. Many communities struggle with that. Many individuals think it is judgment but it is not. It is the most noble thing you can do, is to recognize that you need support of others who are trained in that area. Resiliency is also about giving back. Dr. Groza completed that application for the Child Welfare Fellowship with one hand. Oh, I didn't know that at the time that I was going through the program. Someone let me know that, and I went to him and I said, is that true? And he said, yeah. And I said, why? Because I knew that there were others that needed that profession, that in this profession, that were gonna need that financial support, Nikki. That's what commit, saved me to commit to that. I get it. That's that joy that comes from service and helping others. I hold on to that. Oh, but most importantly, resiliency is about your positive impact in communities and individuals and leaving positive legacies like Professor Strong. Because I didn't know it, but after our conversation, he reached out and had a conversation with Erica. They had worked together in the sex abuse department at Metro Health Hospital. It was no coincidence that she knocked on my door he meant it when he said that he would reach out and make sure I was okay. Having an integrity in anything you do, whether you are servicing at the Veteran Administration or in public health, or if you are a future sports agent, do it with honor. Stay grounded to your family and that mother who will pray for you and tell you that greater is he that is in you when your strength becomes too low, who will be a model for you about commitment and the hope in people, that people do change. Oh, there are some that won't. You focus on those that will receive your help. Oh, but most importantly, resiliency is most definitely a part of having compassion for others, recognizing that humanity will challenge you. Hurt people do hurt people. But if you lead with compassion, others will take your hand. And it may not be 14 years later like in my case, but they will come back to you. And you can have a smile on your face and joy in your heart when they say, Happy Social Work Appreciation Month. Thank you. At this time, we're going to conclude our event with our raffle prizes, which is really exciting. And let's give Nikki one last round of applause, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nikki, for your time and expertise. We have a series of four raffle prizes today, and I'm going to start off with our Mandel School hoodie. If I call your name and you are in person, please come up to the front to collect your prize, and if you are a virtual winner, we'll connect with you after to get your prize arranged. So the winner of our Mandel School hoodie is Kelly Fischietto. Our 
Our next prize is a wireless, a set of wireless earbuds. The winner of the wireless earbuds is Ada Jackson, who is on in the presentation. <laughs> Wonderful, and I believe Ada's online today, so we'll connect with you soon, Ada. Thank you. Our third prize today is a water, waterproof Bluetooth speaker. So wireless as well, fancy. <laughs> the winner of the Bluetooth speaker is Courtney Tunson. <laughs> And lastly, our fourth prize is a Samsung Galaxy tablet. Ooh, ah, ooh, ah. <laughs> the winner of the Samsung tablet is Zayed Hightower. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> right on the side. <laughs> And that will conclude our first Impact Talk series. Let's give Nikki another round of applause, everyone. Thank you for being here.